Sí, sí. Sí, porque es que, a ver, cualquier otra cosa al final se va comiendo tiempo y es muy Yo puedo probar ver si esto funciona. Puedo probar un poco. Yo por eso, si tú no tienes inconveniente, lo más fácil. ¿no? Perdona que no te da demasiado caso, pero es que estoy un poco... Estoy, estamos pillados con esto y no... No, I'm going, I'm going to find, I'm trying to find where the... Uh, Let's No, what I want to, to disconnect is the screen save. Is the screen save? No, 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 I'm just, uh, I was just trying to, to configure the screen saver. I will start the... Uh, So, have you started with the... Um... Yeah, I'm here. No, 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 don't, don't work. Take it, take it easy, thank you. the mic is much more effective those of you who are close to the doors would mind to would you mind to close the doors please robert rafael could you would you mind to know to close the doors thank you well that's uh, for you who are not aware of it uh, this is uh, for the first session of nvrg welcome and uh, if you don't know what this is about This is not your room, I would say. Uh, let's start. We have a very packed agenda. Let's start. This is the uh, uh, notice, the, the IPR policy. It's not a note well because we are not in an ITF meeting. This is a, uh, a, a meeting of, uh, of, of the research group. But please note that we follow the, uh, the same uh, uh, IPR policies that uh, the ITF uh, follows. Well, just a, a very short introduction on the, on the administrivia. You have most of today's and tomorrow's slides on that URL, though we are still making a final adaptation of some of the tomorrow's slides. So wait till tomorrow to be sure. The, today's are, are stable. So if you, so is that at the first, if I remember, was the first five uh, slide decks. I have not seen, I, I, I don't see anyone, well, no, I have uh, five people participating in, in Miteco, that's good. And precisely uh, for that, well, the, and, and apart from that, you have the uh, mailing list information and the usual web and wiki, nothing new. And so, since we have uh, a note taker who's Dirk, uh, thank you. <laughs> no, I, put, I put your name just so, so you could not escape. <laughs> We, we would need at least one JavaScript. Let me say this, a very easy, it's a very easy task. The only thing you have to do is to connect to that uh, Java room. And in case there is some comments or, or, or question from the, uh, from the people that is remotely connecting, just uh, bring it to the mic. Anyone? You will get uh, some stickers uh, that is, uh, will prove that you are so nice. 
We need just one. Come on, you, don't tell me you are never, never connected to Java. Oh. Well, we're going one, going two. Okay, I, I would try, but the problem is that I have my, well, no, I can't, I can't even try. I mean, in the, in the, in the worst case, I can't, can't even try to be a, to act as a JavaScript. I will, but uh, anyway, I, I have the intention. What is this going? I have the intention to note this in, in the minutes that this is, um, uh, you are not a very collaborative uh, community. <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> and anyway, anyway, the... Um, <laughs> we'll try to do it uh, while well, we're going to use my my laptop for the for the uh, slides I will try to uh, to keep uh, to, to keep uh, the, to take care of the Java once I, I I make the presentation because according to our um, at, according to, to our schedule we are we, I'm going the first one speaking anyway just uh, uh, in the in the previous uh, meetings we have had uh, the uh, some set of announcements on ongoing uh, research uh, events uh, related to NFV, but the problem is that, well, we have too many of them. It's sort of that the, uh, the slide would uh, have become completely crutched by the number, um, well, it would be not accurate um, and it would not be useful or whatever. So the idea is that uh, we will uh, refrain from doing so in the coming here and in the coming meters, meetings. But if you, but for sure you're still you're welcome to uh, distribute any call for papers or or whatever, which is related to research events. Uh, and let me let me insist on this because, for example, what is not acceptable and will be uh, stopped by the chairs is, for example, if you uh, call for co any kind of commercial events, uh, so uh, uh, tool uh, availability whatever we're talking about research events research conferences uh, special issues on on, on scientific publications etc please be careful about that the the uh, rg list is not for commercial announcements of any kind events products whatever okay so uh, finally this is the the agenda for this first session apart from this uh, welcome that is about to finish and the question whether you have any uh, concern about this part of the agenda, uh, we will dedicate approx approximately 55 minutes in total to uh, introduce by, uh, to the uh, Open Source Manual project that I do myself. Uh, then we will have Felipe uh, talking about their experience with um, which kind of virtualization technology, the performance of different kind of virtualization technologies. Then we have uh, Dave talking on, on high performance service chaining. And finally, uh, Ranky will make a short announcement about this uh, PPA project. That I, I don't know if you know about it, but you will know. So if you allow me, we will start with the uh, on our, on same our uh, presentation. Uh, let me move it here. Yeah, yes, if you don't mind to make the usual. Uh, uh, next one, just just this uh, this one. Okay, so ah, we have. Okay, now uh, I'm, I'm acting as presenter, so it's a continuum. So it's about introducing this uh, this project that is called, is open source open source mano OSM, that is uh, essentially is a uh, is the uh, consists of the uh, building a, a um, an open source community around. Some seed projects that were originated. One of them is, a, is our Open Mano um, framework that we uh, were presenting two ITFs before in, in Dallas, if I remember well. Next one, please. So uh, the idea basically is well, is that the least you have right there. First is uh, working on, a, on an open on, a, on a, a Mano stack that is first open source and second and very important that is aligned with the with the, with the information and data models um, uh, I, um, I agreed by right? the Etsy and V, not necessarily with all the functional decomposition, and we will, we will see later on what we are talking about. And uh, that is committed to apply 
these uh, these models in the uh, in, in real operation and uh, uh, provide feedback to the uh, to the HCNFE community in the uh, of this application. Very much focus on something that you know has been one of the uh, of our main goals is precisely assuring a predictable predictable performance. When you make a deployment on a virtual uh, infrastructure, being sure that the that the network functions behave according to a stable and predictable performance, not necessarily the highest possible, but predictable. And well, as a, as you can imagine, enable enabling the an ecosystem of solutions that are based in this model-based approach. So. Uh, we, we avoid problems that we were foreseeing from the beginning uh, that uh, on the integration um, on the customers, the operators willing to make the deployments or the, or the, or the required integration on the, uh, on the particular mano dialects that will happen in the future. Next one, please. <coughs> so, it's an open source uh, community that uh, at the end was hosted by, by Etsy. Uh, it's hosted by Etsy as part of their, their strong commitment with uh, NFV, et cetera, and that, um, that uh, provides us with, the, uh, with a very easy and natural alignment with uh, the NFV uh, ISG inside Etsy is done, with, uh, which uh, we intend to make it uh, driven by uh, service provider requirements. You can see there there is a list of the current participants. In fact, this is not completely updated, but because while flew, flying here, I, I knew that there are a couple of other companies that have joined, but anyway, that uh, will help you uh, to have an idea. Uh, the, the ones on the top are the ones that are supposed to be driven, uh, driving the, the process. It's not that they are special in any sense that that. They are users of the, of the manual staff. Uh, the ones that are at the bottom are supposed to be precisely the supporters of the uh, and the, uh, well, it's open to whoever who wants to either join formally the community or as, as usual, contribute a piece of uh, software, contribute ideas, contribute uh, experiences of using the, uh, the platform. This one, please. So uh, the, the essential requirements, apart from providing an orchestration support, et cetera, um, and, and address, addressing the uh, uh, functions of a man stack inside the NFV environment are these four. One is uh, the capability of using enhanced performance awareness. So the idea is that when you make a deployment, you don't make a deployment in, let's say, the uh, vanilla cloud style of he, uh, here you are, cloud orchestrator, do whatever you want to with my, with my functions because I cannot care less. It's about, hey, I need uh, certain, uh, 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 I want to be sure that the performance is going to be between this uh, range, so I want to know where I am or where the orchestrator is going to deploy my, uh, my function and in which conditions and apply these, co these conditions to uh, guarantee uh, a, a certain performance. Second, looking at, the, at what is our real experience and the diversity of organizations like Telefonica, I cannot speak from the rest of operators in the world, but Telefonica is extremely diverse and is, has a, a very, uh, wide footprint in very diverse countries, in despite that most of them speak Spanish, but you know, believe it or not, the differences between Argentina and Spain are huge. And the differences between Argentina and Chile being neighbors are even, even, even larger. So um, that requires that, for example, these two multi things. One is that about being multi thing it's difficult to mandate you are going to use OpenStack and only OpenStack and a particular version of OpenStack in all over our footprint is, well, that gets worse if we talk with our customers, etc. So the idea is precisely to be able to cover a wide variety of different uh, VIMs and multi-site by definition. The idea is that it will work from the beginning in several, a single OSM uh, <coughs> instance will work with several sites from the beginning and with the idea of rethinking the architecture and identifying two main blocks building on the one side with what we call service orchestration and what we call resource orchestration. Next one, please. 
We have decided, and I said, as I said at the beginning, we didn't start from scratch. We are not rewriting the, the whole thing again, because several of the project partners have pieces of code that they were willing to contribute and to adapt and to integrate into the first uh, release of uh, OSM. So we have, uh, as a resource orchestrator, we have uh, the lovely Open Manu. We have uh, Juju Terms to uh, uh, manage precisely uh, VNF, uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, to manage uh, the uh, VNF modeling and for doing VNF configuration. And uh, we have a ritual uh, launchpad for service orchestration or what, and whatever is related to DNS uh, management. Uh, this is, uh, well, it has some advantages, among other things, that before the formal start of the project, we, are, we were able to demonstrate some results already of what we wanted to achieve. And uh, the, uh, well, we, we are in the position of showing by example in which direction, before doing diagrams or whatever, we have running code to show in which direction we want to move the, uh, uh, the project. But they are only an initial uh, starting point. The idea is that all the components will be, well, the components, the components that we're thinking about, a service orchestrator, a resource orchestrator, uh, and, a, and a part that is in charge of, of VNF configuration will be pluggable and, and exchangeable by others that are willing to, to contribute. Next one, please. <coughs> the basic concepts, and this is very important because don't expect that from now on we will be talking about NFEO, VNFM, or whatever. We're talking about what we want to achieve functionally, which is resource orchestration, which is deciding how the resources are going to be organized in order to achieve a certain BNF or well, a certain network services, a, set, a certain network service that is running totally or partially on top of VNFs. Service orchestration, that is precisely how you perform the configuration and how you attach the network functions to your network and how you put all in place to, to, for the service to, to be uh, used by, by your customers. And, uh, well, it's, it's driven by, by these uh, so potential sources, mostly by the operators, by the VNFs themselves, or the, or the management around that or by the infrastructure because of whatever um, uh, requirements or information that is available from the, from the, uh, um, uh, from the uh, infrastructure. And for sure, service orchestration is able to make requests to resource orchestration because the service is the goal, not the, not the resource itself. And, well, when it comes to life cycle management, when we talk about life cycle management, about what happens with something uh, you need to do something with the, uh, with the status of a, of a certain component there that has been virtualized. We believe that all life cycle management at the end is affecting the service and has to be dealt with with a service view. Doesn't make that much sense thinking in our view. And this is something that we can discuss. Doesn't make that much sense to say, no, I have a virtual machine that has to scale. Come on, you don't have to scale the virtual machine. You have to scale up the service. The goal is the service, not the, not the virtual machine. You have to inform the service that you're doing something in the virtual machine because that will affect the internal function. It will affect the uh, attachment points. It will affect at the end how you are interacting with outside of the, of the service. So all, the, all these decisions is something that we want to be taking at the service level. Next one, please. So that implies that we are trying to change a little bit the mappings First of all is that OSM is going to consider the uh, uh, green part there in the, uh, in the diagram. So we want to go a little bit beyond the, the, the pure NFVO uh, limits because otherwise we don't have pure, uh, complete service visibility on the one hand. And on the other hand is that precisely the idea is that if you look at how it's a structure, uh, resource orchestration and, and um, life cycle management are now split in two parts, and the idea is to make an evolution of this into moving, moving this. So you, uh, what, what you achieve is that you can think that, well, the NFEO has a part which has to deal with life cycle management as the, as the BNFM, but you have, and you have resource orchestration in both parts. Why not unify them in a single functional component? For sure, that makes, it's true that that implies that you, will, you won't have 
if you're using OSM, you want to have a, something that you can call, this is the NFVO, I can plug it, I'm plugging something different. But let me insist, we are trying to achieve a fully functional environment that is much more focused on function and not necessarily on architecture. That's one place. And again, it's a model-driven approach. This is something that probably you have heard several times about when talking about uh, things like uh, ODL, but essentially it's the idea that you keep consistently using the same models for development, for, for, for uh, uh, testing, and for final uh, deployments, and, 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 <coughs> <coughs> and service provisioning, and that implies that uh, you can support the so, so, uh, so fashionable things like uh, DevOps and, and, and continuous integration. And we are strongly committed to, uh, uh, to contribute back to a TNFE. Next one, please. I'm trying to, to accelerate a little bit. This is a list of the challenges we, we see. There are these, uh, several slides on this. One is when you talk about the resource orchestration, what is very important, at least for me, is that, that, that one is mentioned horizontal virtualization. During a couple of days here, we have been heard about the, uh, that we have to think about what are the characteristics of a virtual firewall, a virtual router, a virtual uh, switch. Well, I would say that we should not be thinking any longer on that. We should be thinking on which are the functions that we can virtualize. And the functions is a forwarding plane, a filtering um, uh, engine, uh, a policy enforcer, whatever, that are not the boxes we're, we, we're used to think. We're talking about functions and about building, building uh, services by com combining those functions that are not, right now, let me insist, the nodes. Nodes, current, current nodes have several functions. The idea is to decompose those functions and allow, uh, 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 and allow uh, uh, a horizontal integration. And this is, in my view, this is one of the essential challenges that we have when we want to have, we have, to, have to support that new decomposition. Next one, please. Uh, when it comes to the, uh, from the service orchestration is precisely what is very important is the first one, it's about this current end-to-end -end view at the network service level, maintaining it at all the levels, depending on, independently of the orchestration, the life cycle events, etc. And the idea that you are able to seamless manage multi-tenancy, because the, some of the, in a certain service, you can have a combination of functions that are used by one more than by more than one tenant because of efficiency and performance and uh, the, uh, network functions that are assigned to, to a tenant and you have to have a proper identity management and security and isolation principles there that has to be enforced by the uh, by the service orchestrator next one please for the models well the, the first is, uh, is about addressing realistic NFV environments it's not about let's make another MME that is virtualized, and let's show that they, they are, here is the MME, but, uh, but isolated. It's about going for full services, including what we call the network scenarios that are the combination of the parameters that are associated with the VNFs. And uh, something that is very important when it comes to the VM, et cetera, is about the layer two topology. When you make the deployment, there are certain uh, effects that happen with current uh, uh, cloud management that you can simply not afford. Next one, please. For the Bing, for the Bing is essentially is about support on a EPA that we currently support, fully support in open mano and is partially supported in, in other, in other, um, in other uh, VMs like for example, OpenSAC and we are strongly committed to go and try to contribute and to, to make OpenStack evolve in that direction on the one hand. And, and the second is facilitating that in a direct integration with, with OPNFV, so we are part of the, uh, of the ecosystem there. Next one, please. So, and that, this is just to finish. We ran a demo at the, at the recent uh, Mobile World Congress in Barcelona this February. It's using, I, I, uh, I'll tell you, it's using a very realistic scenario of, uh, of um, uh, a VPN using vault -E for an enterprise environment. It is completely automated. It runs using this, uh, this uh, RiveTO um, launchpad interface. This, and you can, and it's, uh, it tries to prove 
essentially the main concepts that are behind OSM when we, it comes to full end-to-end -end service automation, support for, for APA, the capability of being multi-site and multi -main, and the combination of, this, of the different uh, VNFs depending on their performance and the requirements. And uh, well, our idea, well, it has helped us a lot in identifying uh, limitations and, and, and potential evolutions. Next one that I guess is the last. Well, these are, you have there, in the, you have there the uh, couple of, of uh, videos on the how, on the, on the left-hand side, what the demo was about. On the right-hand side, if you are more curious and, and you have time in, enough time, more detail about how the demo infrastructure was built, etc. You, I, I won't show anything, don't, don't, don't panic about that today, but if you're curious, you, you want to have a look, I will be more than happy to try to address any questions you have while here, uh, while you're back home, whatever. Next one, and it's just the last one, please. This is simply, uh, last one. Yeah, this is simply just to remember if you are, if you are interested in in have a look at what we are doing, how we are doing, how we are planning to do it, and, and, and you want to to join the uh, the party, is there. And I'm done, I'm, I guess in time. time for like one question. One question, okay, perfect. If there is one. Robert Gopher. I, I could imagine, yes. Robert Sabo Eriksson. I wonder if you considered hierarchies of the service orchestration, resource orchestration, in the context, you mentioned multiple sites and multiple VIMs. So what, the, what is your view on this? In the current version, no. The current version is, uh, has a resource orchestrator and a, and a service orchestrator, sorry. Yes, resource and service. In for future versions, is in the is in the let's say in the roadmap or in the plan to go. Yes, it will be considered. Not in this demo, you won't see this. Definitely. I think. Up to I think the chair. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you, and also a uh, reminder on the blue sheets in case you haven't signed. Uh, please do sign them. Thank you. So next one is right. Yeah. No, 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 yeah. I have to move it here. Okay. Thanks. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Felipe Wisi. I'll be talking for the next 20 minutes or so about um, some experiences we've had uh, while doing performance tests with different virtualization technologies ranging from VMs, unikernels, uh, okay. tiny uh, distributions of general purpose OSs and containers. Next, please. Okay, so in the beginning, uh, the VM uh, king was uh, on charge of everything and everything was good. Uh, that was the only uh, game in town. And then uh, what happened was uh, we got a, a couple of more options around uh, virtualization uh, for running VNFs and for other things as well. One of them is uh, what people are, are, are calling uh, Linux tinification. It's basically uh, taking uh, sort of stripped down kernels and distributions and, and building VMs around those. Uh, click please. Along with that, we have something called unikernels, which are specialized VMs uh, on top of basically minimalistic OSs, so not uh, general purpose OSs like Linux or FreeBSD, but uh, so, uh, sort of minimalistic ones and basically single application VMs. And I will explain what these are in more detail later on. Quick. And of course, uh, containers. And so what happens is that the VM king is not happy anymore. Uh, he's not the only game in town anymore. But um, quick. The question is, um, where are we in terms of performance? And performance can mean uh, very many different things. So we took a, a number of different metrics. Uh, one of them is how big is the virtual machine image size because it matters in terms of uh, shipping it out and then lifecycle management. Uh, memory consumption, of course, uh, we have things like VM creation time, destruction time, migration times. Uh, we have delay, which is important certainly for, for NFE. And we have, of course, uh, throughput. Next. Okay, so we have a sort of uh, line that sort of stretches between higher overhead and lower overhead. Uh, click, we probably have the standard VM uh, towards the sort of higher overhead range of things. Um, and then we have uh, these uh, tinyfied VMs, which are probably uh, have lower overhead. And then we have these uh, specialized VMs called unikernels. And then all the way on the right, uh, we have containers, right? Um, but the question is, 
you know, probably this is the order, uh, but how far right or how far left are they? Um, next, right? So it could be that unikernels are actually close to containers or not, quick. Um, or it could be that unikernels for some metrics are ahead of containers or not. Um, so the question is, can we actually quantify some of this? So I already mentioned the metrics. I can give you a little bit, uh, so say a little bit about the methodology. So for VM image and member consumption, we use standard tools like LS, top. Uh, if we're on Zen, we use Excel. Uh, for the VM creation time, what we do is we create the VM and then we do a sin flood and then we measure when we get a, a reset um, for the, uh, we do reset detection basically. For throughput, we use iperf and modifies versions of iperf because uh, iperf will run on a Linux VM okay, it'll run on containers okay, uh, but if you're running on a minimalistic OS, uh, that's not the same API as Linux, for instance, so you need to slightly modify iperf to run on those. For RTT, we just do a ping flood. Uh, all of the VM tests are run both on Zen and KVM, and we use a fairly standard, not, not so expensive x86 server. Oh, I, I did not have sorry. No problem. We'll get there eventually. No. Okay. So, um, as I said, on that timeline, we had sort of four points. We have standard VMs. For this, we used a Debian-based Linux VM. We have these tinyfied VMs. Uh, we use something called Tinyx, which is essentially a, a sort of stripped-down Linux kernel uh, and a very small distro, which is essentially BusyBox and iperf and, and nothing more, and I'll give you more details about that. Uh, for unikernels on Zen, we use uh, MiniOS as the uh, minimalistic OS, and we put something called MiniPerf on top, which is I modified iperf, basically. And for KVM, we use OSV as the minimalistic OS and then iperf. Uh, containers is uh, Docker. Click. So now I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about, uh, so, so of course, containers you're aware of, standard VMs you're aware of, uh, maybe these tiny five VMs and unikernels are a little bit more complicated, so I'll say a few things about those uh, first tiny five VMs. Okay, so a standard VM is an application on top of a distro. You have a lot of stuff, uh, different layers at the kernel, services, libraries. You have a lot of elements, click. But ultimately, you only use a few of them. In this case, if you want to run Nginx, uh, there's only a few libraries you use, only a few uh, kernel modules you use, and the rest is sort of just there idle. So the idea under, and this is not our idea, uh, there's a lot of people working on uh, what they call Linux tinyfication, especially from the embedded world, is to sort of take only, try to build the, the smallest distro, distros and kernels possible while still keeping the Linux ABI because then you have compatibility with applications. Yep. And so um, what we call Tinyx is a tailor-made distribution. And this is an example with Nginx, but we, we used one with iperf, of course. Click. Uh, and just to give you an idea, this is what uh, the ps command looks on, on Tinyx. Um, it looks busy, but actually, uh, click, uh, most of those are just um, kernel, kernel threads and processes. And click again. It's only the bottom part that's the user space stuff. And if you look, you have uh, four uh, Nginx threads. You have an SSH server so that we can log in for convenience. And, and then you have a shell and nothing more, right? So there's really nothing much running on there. Okay, click. And uh, click again, please. OK, uh, click. So that was the time 5 VM. Uh, unikernels, um, go ahead, please, once more. OK, so what's a unikernel? Uh, it's a specialized VM. So it's normally a single application plus a minimalistic OS. Um, these minimalistic OSs generally have a single address space, a cooperative scheduler. So there's very few overheads. There's no context switches, no preemption, things like that. So uh, and of course, uh, you know, there's no extraneous code. Click. So in a picture, uh, if you have a standard VM, uh, you have a kernel space, you have a bunch of drivers, you have user space with a ton of applications on top. Click. And then in, in a unikernel, you just have a single application, just a few drivers, and a single memory address space. Okay. So. What about uh, what we used? So to do benchmarking, we built a unikernel that has uh, just iperf on top of it. So on Zen, uh, click please, uh, the application is iperf and it sits on top of miniOS and on uh, KVM, uh, we have um, iperf and then OSV uh, at the bottom. And OSV is just a, a open source uh, minimalistic OS uh, for not only for KVM, but uh, originally for KVM. Okay, uh, you should know that um, 
there are quite a few optimizations to Zen and KVM uh, when we run our uh, small VMs and unikernels. Uh, I don't have time to go over those. So, whereas the container numbers are just off the shelf container numbers. Uh, we haven't gotten around to optimizing those. Okay. So some of the results. Uh, the first one, uh, image size. Um, so how big are they? These are the blue bars. So uh, you can see it's in megabytes. And then at the bottom in the x-axis, you have all the different setups, right? So from left to right, you have the standard VMs on Zen and KVM. You have the uh, containers. Uh, you have uh, unikernels on KVM and on Zen. And then you have this Tynix small VM on Zen and KVM. Uh, so the blue bars are image size. And sort of the, the takeaway message here is that uh, the unikernels Five minutes. The unikernels on mini OS are uh, the smallest, but containers, and, um, and then uh, you have things like the Tynix is still pretty small, 3.7 megs and so forth. So uh, memory usage, you can see uh, it's about um, containers, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, wins 3.8 megs. Uh, unikernels are the next uh, behind about 8 megs. Uh, and that's, of course, because containers, a lot of the memory usage and buffer uh, and so forth is actually in the uh, Linux kernel. Boot times, um, this is a log scale. Uh, we have, uh, again, this is unoptimized container, so it's 1.7 seconds. And then we have Tynix uh, beating that, uh, 400 milliseconds. The smallest ones are the unikernels on Zen, 31 milliseconds. Uh, but we can also get it down to under 10 milliseconds. Next, RTT. Um, the containers uh, win here. So about 4 milliseconds. Uh, unikernels are not far behind, uh, 5 and 9 milliseconds on Zen and KVM. Uh, and then uh, Tynix and, and standard VMs. Uh, not surprisingly, some of the standard VMs have the same timings because the kernel itself is basically the same. Next. Uh, throughput, uh, TX and RX, um, I'm just really summarizing now. Um, we get, we've get we optimized TX on Zen, so we get uh, the highest throughput with the, the, the mini OS on Zen. Uh, containers are not far behind. Uh, Rx uh, is sort of the same story, okay? So the conclusions is that uh, basically what people repeat is VMs have really good isolation but are heavyweight, so you have to choose between either containers or, or VMs depending on whether you want isolation or performance. Uh, what I'm trying to suggest with these numbers is that this is a lot more nuanced. It's not such a clear winner one way or the, or the other depending on the metrics and depending what you mean by a VM, right? Um, so the sort of takeaway message is, um, you know, if you if you thought this was sort of clear and easy, it's it's actually not. Uh, things like unikernels and uh, sort of tinyfied VMs uh, provide you with other points in that timeline uh, that make it so um, that they may be a viable um, alternative to containers in sort of multi-tenant deployments where isolation is is a must, at least until uh, isolation in containers catches up. Um, and the last one, yeah, the VM King is uh, sort of happy again. Last one, um, I'm not going to read through this, but this is pro uh, potential contributions that, uh, that we could do towards this uh, containers draft. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. No, we, we have uh, there and there from, for a while, so please. So when you were uh, using con uh, Dockers, you said containers, you were probably using LXCs. Did you try to use C groups with Dockers or you were just focused on LXCs? It was LXC. Yeah, we didn't do that. Yeah, yeah we, haven't, uh, we haven't looked at optimizing containers uh, because we just haven't gotten to that. Um, so you may say this is a somewhat unfair comparison because you've optimized the heck out of Zen KVM and Unikernels and you've sort of taken vanilla containers. Um, and that's a fair enough comment. Uh, you should take away orders of magnitude comparisons out of this rather than the actual numbers. Um, a question for, uh, very good news. Sure. Um, so very nice work. So one of the things we have an active draft in the area of containers, of course, um, we are actually right now more investigating the issues. And what you're finding is, I think, the security implications is kind of one of the biggest blockers to container adoption, besides the other issues around, you know, VNF, VNF vendors moving slow and also the OS support. So 
uh, what is your take on the security front? Have you done any benchmarking work there so far? So what do you mean by benchmarking of security? Um, so in a sense, uh, say, um, so for example, you know, PMs by nature are secure, right? When you go to uh, the container landscape, say through C groups and all those mm -hmm. provision, if you yeah. add those additional security hooks, uh, how will that have impact the performance? That's what I meant. So basically, uh, you know, anything you add to make the container deployment more secure, then how does it start comparing on the performance? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I haven't, uh, we're not security guys. Uh, we're sort of systems and performance guys. Uh, I guess it would be possible for us to benchmark different versions of uh, containers with and without different security options, but no, we haven't done that yet. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, yes. Now, now we have Dave on. Let me, let me open it. All right, hi, I'm Dave Dolson, um, work at Sand Divine. First, off, first slide, please. Okay, so I want to then talk about uh, performance, high performance, uh, NFE. Um, just to give you a bit of background of where we're coming from is that we've actually been using, uh, building our network appliances using uh, commodity off the sh or commercial off the shelf uh, Intel processors for about 14 years now inside our appliances. We've been achieving horizontal scale using load balancing techniques and something that was kind of like a service chain. And uh, recently, um, we demonstrated uh, one, one terabit per second in 10 rack units of commercial off the shelf hardware with, um, in conjunction with, with Dell and Intel. So um, next slide, please. I'll tell you how to get information on that later. Um, so the way we're coming at this is we're looking at uh, being, you know, a transparent middle box. Think of it like a, a bump in the wire, possibly multiple wires in which the traffic is being routed in asymmetrical manner. I'll talk a bit more about that later too. Um, so some of the goals, um, these should be pretty not contentious, I think. You know, we want to say, how do we really minimize latency? really get the best possible gigabits per second per watt and gigabits per second per rack unit while using commercial off-the-shelf hardware. Next, please. Okay, first of all, I'll talk about how to make a fast component. So just one of the service functions. So the, the good news is that for you know simple tasks, you know, forwarding, counting, a lot of things, uh, software really can keep up with uh, line rates with intercept interface rates. And I know others have reported this too. Um, I'll talk about these four points as to why these are important. You know, one of them is to think about breaking your jobs down into multiple independent threads, uh, locking those threads to physical cores where they get the whole core to themselves, um, connecting those threads to physical hardware where they, you know, really are closely connected to the drivers and using the software techniques of zero copy forwarding. Next, please. Mm. My fault, of course. No. You wasted my time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> 10 seconds. Okay. You want 10 seconds more. Okay, so first point. Um, you, when you have these multi-core processors, you know, the, the newer processors all have uh, multiple cores. Uh, we found the best way to, to utilize these is to have multiple independent threads that share nothing. Um, we found that you know, any use of semaphores between threads, even if they're not contested, are, um, they, they really cut down on your memory bandwidth. So our approach is slice up the network data so that each thread can work independently on, on its chunk of data. So um, if you're a, uh, an internet service provider, a natural way to slice this is to put individual subscribers traffic on different uh, processors and not have to have any crosstalk between these. Um, other approaches are just, if you don't think about subscribers, think about uh, using IP address hashing or something like that. And when I say thread here, by the way, 
there's different kind of approaches you can take. One approach is, you know, a lightweight thread in a process, or you can have independent processes, or even individ independent virtual machines. And there's different ways of, of breaking it down. Next, please. Um, okay, we found it uh, also important to um, assign these threads to, to really lock them down to the cores that they're allowed to use. So in a virtual environment, this is you know, two things. On the, on the host, you want, to dedicate, you want to dedicate the specific hardware cores to specific virtual machines. And then within the virtual machines, you have to lock your threads to specific cores if you've given your virtual machine more than one core. Um, you know, and, and the reason for this is you get the benefit of caching, instruction caching and data caching, and also the, you know, the packets, you want them to, to arrive in uh, to the right core. And uh, one else, other thing worth pointing out is on some of these, um, some of these blades, for example, that have multiple CPUs on them, uh, not all the CPUs are connected to the hardware in exactly the same way. Um, it's the, the NUMA architecture also, they have different memories and is uh, closer, is faster on different processors. So, um, you know, we found that uh, sometimes you'll have one of the CPU sockets will be connected to the PCI bus for the interfaces and the other one is not. So it's actually more expensive to get the traffic to the other CPU. So you may, if your application has a fast path and a control plane, you may choose to put the, the fast path on the, the one that's closer to the interfaces. Next, please. Another thing that we found very important is to use the physical function pass through or SRIOV. Now, I know everyone may not know what this is. Um, physical function pass through in a nutshell is when you give the device driver, you give the actual device hardware to the virtual machine. It, it owns it, and it disappears from the operating system of the host. Uh, SRIOV is um, a, a technology in which the hardware take one physical interface, give it multiple MAC addresses, and the hardware sorts the packets into different queues for each, each of your threads, so you can attach um, and so now the hardware is sorting the packets for you, and you don't need a piece of software to sit there between the physical function and the virtual machines. I think I've explained that now, so thanks. <laughs> so, so those are my hint tips for within one virtual machine. Now, how to, how to scale out. So I mentioned earlier about what we call asymmetrical traffic. And the reason I'm going down this road is because some service functions, particularly transparent service functions, want to see all traffic of a flow in both directions. Um, you know, think of a, you know, a firewall. If it sees a, typically you say, I want to allow a, a flow in if I saw the SIN packet out and then I'm gonna allow the traffic in. If you're only seeing the incoming traffic, you can't make the right decision. Anyway, but as we, no, in, uh, in the internet, packets can take multiple routes, they can take multiple links. So we wanna bring those uh, together for processing. So next slide, please. So this is a, a typical way we put together a solution. Uh, the devices on the left, those would be your intersecting a link. So uh, these would be like, uh, transparently, you want to make a bump in the wire view there. So the traffic coming in, say on the top one, the red path, the traffic comes to a, a device, and I'm, I'm showing this like uh, a service function chaining now, where we hit a classifier, choose the virtual machine to send the traffic through. The virtual machine returns the traffic to the link it's supposed to go out. I can have another link on the bottom, shown by the blue, blue path, with traffic in the opposite direction being sent to the same virtual machine because it's the same subscriber or it's the same IP address or it's, and, and we call this, um, you know, you can think of it as, there's two things going on here. There's a load balancing. We're trying to make use of all the, the virtual machines in a fair way. And also we're consistently um, removing the asymmetrical traffic. Next slide, please. 
So something I also want to talk about is we think of the east-west bottleneck. You know, the more virtual machine, every time the traffic goes in and out of the virtual machine onto the switch fabric, you've, you're using up interface bandwidth. And as I mentioned earlier, because the software generally can keep up with uh, the interface rates, you are really become bottlenecked on, on the bandwidth. Um, we also uh, point out that as you encapsulate traffic, you make the traffic bigger. And it, traffic that comes in on a link can't go to the, it, when it goes to the service function, it actually takes more bandwidth than it comes, than it initially. Um, so maybe this is kind of obvious, but if you have a two-touch solution, if your packet goes to two machines, you really need twice the gear of a one-touch solution. So you really, that's okay, I guess, for, for the functions themselves. But if you're adding extra components to just, uh, you know, touch the traffic to forward it, it becomes an extra cost. Okay, next please. So one of my suggestions for the service function chaining, um, everyone here may not be familiar with it, but uh, there's a service function forwarder, SFF, and there's a service function. These are identified as com architectural components. Uh, we think it's really a good thing to put them in the same thread. So even though they're architecturally are distinct components, we suggest putting them together. Um, because, you know, if you have a separate software component to do the service function forwarding, you're dedicating at least a core to do the forwarding per interface. You're adding extra latency, extra queuing, and it's also, if it's on a different device, it's consuming your east-west budget. Next, please. So this is uh, service chaining, one service chain, so you think of it as one packet, through two functions. With the service function forwarder inside the function itself. So, you know, packet can come in, be classified, choose a virtual machine. The virtual machine, because it's got the SFF function in it, can, five, minutes. five minutes, okay. It can be forwarded to the next virtual machine, and then it can be forwarded to the final hop. Whereas, if, next slide. If there's an external forwarding function, you know, it has to go to the, <coughs> the SF, to the SFF, back to the next SF, SFF. So that, that function on the bottom is really, um, every packet's going in and out twice. Uh, and it, it, it's really chewing up a lot of band, uh, interface bandwidth. Next, please. So my point about uh, to minimize encapsulation overhead, you know, it's not really a, an MTU question to us because we can control the MTU in this environment. It's a question that every time you encapsulate, you make the packet bigger. It's reducing the effective bandwidth because your packets are bigger. Uh, you know, 10 gigabits in, 10.1 gigabits come out. You, you may not be able to take 10 gigabits in. So in the service function, um, sorry, in the NSH environment, in kind of the architecture I was showing you, we would choose direct encapsulation on top of the ethernet. So we would take the Mac, uh, followed immediately by an NSH header, run it on the same layer two segment. We would resort to using an IP encapsulation only if the devices were separated by an IP network. And there are different metadata types uh, proposed for NSH and, and we would take the type two when we don't need the extra space for the metadata. Next please. Okay, and, and then I was reflecting, I think I'm almost at the end, I was reflecting on the question that everyone asks is, you know, okay, so how many VMs do I, do I need? And unfortunately, the answer right now is, you know, it depends. <laughs> um, I'm trying to give you a hint from, you know, all the, the things I talked about. It depends on, okay, how is the application written? Did, were different threads used? Uh, how much memory bandwidth is used? you know, the characteristics of the application itself, what kind of technology I'm running on, is the application written in a way that's compatible with the kind of architecture I'm running on, um, does the application support the offload to the NIC in the SRIOV sense, um, does your infrastructure support that, um, am I able to assign cores, threads to cores, can my virtual machines accept that configuration of which cores to run the threads on, and then, you know, the real hard part comes in thinking about the path of your packets. 
you know, how many interfaces do they have to go in and out to satisfy your solution? And is your uh, switching and interfaces, are they bottlenecking your solution? So it may not just be the VM performance that's bottlenecking it. Next, please. So zero copy packets, use your hardware acceleration, pass through SRIOV, slice up the traffic, really think about the east-west traffic, try to minimize that, minimize number of touches, and to do that, put your forwarding decisions in, in the thread it, of the function itself, and keep the packet overhead low. I think my last slide is the next one. And I've included a link to our, our blog post on the terabit per second performance. It's a uh, you know, it's marketing material, but it does have a lot of details uh, in all the different, you know, exactly what hardware we used and uh, how we assigned uh, functions to cores and how we wired up and all the different parts we purchased and put together for the demonstration. And some of this is also discussed in the draft in the SFC section, but uh, that's just something I contributed recently. Do we have any questions? Thank you for the questions. Uh, if I may ask before uh, he's getting onto the mic. Um, so essentially, what okay. you're proposing is sorry. Uh, what you're proposing is uh, the SFF being absorbed with the service function. That means if you know you need overlays, then that is happening right there as part of the service function itself. You're instantiating yeah. overlay. Is that a fair uh -huh. assumption? I don't know if it's an. It's an overlay. It's the same. So it, you um, know, essentially, it depends on the deployment. Right? You are doing SF, the service chaining function, but if uh, you need an overlay, then do you consider that happening separately, or be still part of you know what you're doing? Yeah, I didn't think about that, but yeah, I think you could think about overlays there as well. So if you can remove, you know, an extra thread, its only job is to say encapsulate and and do a next hop. I, I think that's a, a good performance choice. What? Now it may become more, maybe you may want to trade that off with for other objectives, but uh, from a purely performance point of view, I think that's what my point. Is, I mean, if, uh, I mean, overlays deployments are there uh, everywhere, and if, it, if uh, that doesn't, I mean, if you don't gel those together, then you don't get the best of yeah. Sure. Um, so what I meant was uh, <laughs> if, I mean, oh, oh, I think. Move. Oh, you unplugged it. Okay. So what I meant was essentially, um, from what you're seeing, unless overlays are combined with such an idea, I mean, it doesn't get the full deployment benefit. That's all. I mean, and overlays yeah. are there right. anywhere, everywhere. I see what you mean. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Thank you. Just in case any any anyone else wanted to make a question, we are closing the line. So. Felipe, please. Okay, I'll try to be quick. So the first one is a clarification question. Are if, you using, if you don't mind to identify yourself. I Mac. thought you had identified. No, 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 I mean, I mean it's a, <laughs> let's just say that you are Felipe Wussi. Oh, yeah, but, Felipe Wussi. Uh, first, uh, a very quick clarification question. Is it KVM and, and OpenV switch? Uh, what, what are you using as the technologies? Uh, yes, I think it's, I believe it's KVM, yeah. Okay, and and the second one is you, we've been doing uh, performance optimization for NFP for a while and performance measurements. So a lot of the things you touched upon are certainly tricky. Another one that's even worse is that a lot of the NFV functions are dependent, how expensive they are is completely dependent on the traffic uh, matrix and, and what's actually in the traffic. I'm thinking DPIs and things like that. Um, how do you cope with those? Yeah, I think uh, we talk about that in, in our report. I, I, I think we did a traffic, uh, we call the internet traffic mix, which is kind of a sampling of all different types of traffic. To, together, so okay, and and what's the but one I, second? I, I, uh, I agree with you that it, it does. That's probably something else I should have put in my it depends slide. It is the type of traffic that you're looking at. Okay, this is this is the kind of thing of discussion I would love to see in the list, please. I mean, this is a if you if you have some uh, uh, particular uh, uh, patterns to 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 uh, to validate this, and this is the kind of, of thing that would help us in in making evolve this and, and make a real contribution. Now, I'm sorry, but this, no, should be. Dan uh, Bogdanovich, um, 
more and more, uh, especially data center operators are complaining about, you know, the power consumption and the heat dissipation. Uh, when you're, you know, looking into the performance, are you looking in any of those, you know, what is the power cost per bit, you know, and the heat dissipation cost per bit? Because this is also some, you know, those thermodynamics are giving them more and more headache. Yeah, as our, you know, this is one of my second criteria. If you go to our report, you can get the exact numbers that we yeah. talked about. We talk about uh, watts per gigabit or gigabits per watt. I can't remember which it was. We found it just, um, you know, a little bit more than our in, in appliance. And you can anyway see some comparisons we made. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, the last the last one should be very very quick because uh, Ranki asked it uh, asked explicitly to be to, to make it very short. So here you go. Awesome. Yeah, just um, go to the next slide, please, straight away. Yeah, thank you. So when you started off NFERG, one of the uh, key goals was I mean not just drafts and ideas, but influence real, how do you influence real implementations happening? And uh, with that, we, would, we wanted to make a direct impact on open, the most relevant open source projects, which include OpenStack, OpenDelight, and OPNFE. Um, and with that, essentially what we did was, we, also, we saw that the policy-based resource management work item has had the maximum interest in the community, you know, I think 10 plus, in fact, close to 15 drafts. And, uh, in fact, specifically on the resource management, tying it to policy is something uh, we've been working with the NFERG team and also the OpenStack community for uh, almost last four months, uh, refining a proposal. And the output of it is, I'd like to call as a policy-driven platform aware scheduler. Um, essentially, if you look at, you know, the OpenStack uh, scheduling framework and, you know, so several presenters talk about the need for platform awareness. Diego talked about it. You know, Dave talked about it. I mean, basically, SRAOV, um, all those, I and mean, hardware acceleration, how do you bring, down, bring them on board? So some of the key problems we see with the current OpenStack scheduling framework are that the framework is not extensible. I mean, if you want to add a new feature, you have to wait six months, right? Basically, you know, next OpenStack release. And also, uh, when it comes to usability, and in terms of uh, you know whether you made the right placement decision, how you actually verify whether things happened, even there there is a gap. And also the other big problem we see is like you know lack of a single representation for monitoring and placement. That means essentially you know when uh, resource utilization changes, you want to go verify and see whether you know this should be the right placement or it should be something else. So these are some of the key areas you're addressing to the spec and. I think the best part about this is essentially the feature velocity. That means this is headed in the DevOps direction. And essentially, being able to introduce new features, you know, at DevOps space in the order of weeks, and not wait for an OpenStack release. And there is a detailed spec which is under review. Basically, you have to open follow the OpenStack community process, which is pretty intense. And it's kind of somewhere between use cases and also a strong developer influence based on the current code base and what can be done and cannot be done. And we'll have a big presentation in the upcoming OpenStack Summit where we'll not just talk about the use cases, the uh, current problems faced, and also the architecture, and perhaps some you know, implementation details. Um, and last but not least, I would like to say that the goal of this is not just producing, but also who's going to be the consumer. That'll be OSM uh, you know, and um, you know, Tacker, uh, OpenStack Tacker, which is another OpenStack uh, uh, orchestration project or uh, at and ecom, you know, it can be anything because the way we are defining the northbound APIs is through OpenStack heat template and we're not changing that consumption model. It can be easily consumed. So that's all I had. Okay, so it's about time that we have to leave. Just to uh, remind you that tomorrow there will be a much more exciting and longer um, session in which we will discuss drafts, etc. At is at uh, two, right? From two to four. See you tomorrow. Uh, who has uh, who has the, uh, the the blue sheets?